morning. I'm Carrie Gillen, and I'm the substitute today for our women's Bible study on Romans here at Green Acres Baptist Church. If you're interested in getting the handout, it is on our website, and you can download that and follow it. So this morning, we're going to get in to studying and rehearsing and reviewing Romans. And so I want to start out today with reading you a story. John Harper was born in a Christian home in Glasgow, Scotland in 1872. When he was about 14 years old, he became a Christian, and from that time on, he began to tell others about Christ. At 17 years of age, he began to preach, going down the streets of his village, pouring out his soul in passionate preaching for men to be reconciled to God. After five or six years of toiling on street corners and preaching the gospel and working in the mill during the day, Harper was taken by the Reverend E.A. Carter of Baptist Pioneer Mission in London. Can you imagine what that was like, Baptist Pioneer Mission. This set Harper free to devote his whole time and energy to do the work so dear to him, evangelism. Soon, in September 1896, Harper started his own church. While pastoring this church in London, Harper continued his fervent and faithful zeal for evangelism. He was such a zealous evangelist that the Moody Church in Chicago asked him to come over to America for a series of meetings. He did, and they went well. A few years later, Moody Church asked if he would come back again. And so it was at that time that Harper and his six-year-old daughter, Nana, boarded a ship, the Titanic, one day with a second-class ticket at Southampton, England, for the voyage to America. What happened after Harper boarded the ship, we know only from two sources. One is Nana, who died in 1986 at the age of 80, she remembers being woken up by her father a few nights into their journey. It was about midnight, and he woke up his young daughter that the ship had struck an iceberg. Harper told his six-year-old daughter that another ship was just about there to rescue them, but as a precaution, he was going to put her in a lifeboat with her older cousin who was with them. As for Harper, he would wait for another ship to arrive. Little Nana and her cousin were ultimately rescued and saved. What we know happened next comes from another source. Months later, in a prayer meeting in Hamilton, Ontario, a Scotsman stood up, and with tears streaming down his face, he told the extraordinary story of his conversion to Christ. He explained that he had recently been on the Titanic the night it struck the iceberg. He was clinging to a piece of floating debris in the freezing waters when a wave brought John Harper near him. John Harper, too, was clinging to some of the debris from the wreckage. Harper called out to the man, Man, are you saved? No, I'm not. Harper shouted back, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. A wave came in and took Harper away, but a little later another wave washed Harper closer to the same man. Are you saved now? Harper called out, No, I answered. Well, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Then losing, losing his hold on the wood, Harper sank. The man said, there alone in the night with two miles of water under me, I trusted Christ as my Savior. I am John Harper's last convert. It has been said that only one life will soon be passed, and only what's done for Christ will last. John Harper made the most of his one fleeting life on earth. He ended his life as a hero. He was clearly a hero to his daughter for waking her up and putting her into a lifeboat. And he was clearly a hero to the Scotsman who trusted Christ by floating on debris in the icy waters. What would you have done if you had been focusing, what would you have been focusing on if you were clinging to debris in the freezing waters in the middle of the ocean about to die? Harper was focused on serving Christ as his faithful ambassador to the very end. From the moment of his salvation to the moment of his death, John Harper lived to pass the life-saving message of salvation through Christ to others. John Harper lived with a mission to make Christ known. Now I want to ask you this morning, hopefully none of us will ever be shipwrecked in freezing waters, but what would your focus be if that was happening to you? Now we may not end up in the deep icy waters today, but many of us are facing illnesses, financial devastation, family issues that are going on. What would our focus be if we were facing our last moments here on earth. And look how intentional he was to share the gospel and ask the man if he had been saved. So that's what I want us to do this morning is to rehearse the gospel so that when and if we're put in that place 
we will know how to share it. Now, I know most of you are quite familiar with Romans, but I want you to know as I studied back through it this, this, for this study, Jada did such a beautiful job doing it, but I realized there are so many bells and whistles to the gospel that I had somehow let fall by the wayside. And so the Lord speaks to me in the natural a lot to teach me things spiritually. So two years ago, my husband bought me a brand new Ford Explorer from Barney Rubin, our faithful car dealer. And um, that new car came with this manual. And his lovely son-in-law, who works for him, came and sat in my driveway. And we looked at all the dashboard and all the bells and whistles. And he plugged in my phone. And all my phone numbers went up on the screen. And then we hooked up Bluetooth. And then all of a sudden, I could voice activate to change the temperature in the car and even let me listen. It would read me my text. And then I could audibly respond to it. And then it had all these other features on it. And one that I won't tell you how often has popped up is when a car in front of me makes a bad choice and I have to stop suddenly, <laughs> this bright light and this flaring gong goes on. It says pre-collision alert. And it stops my car. And I went, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and so, um, and so I, occasionally I have to get out the manual. Like this morning, I had to get it out to know how to set my clock, you know, daylight savings time. Um, and amazingly, when I went into the settings, I could have clicked a button and it would have automatically set it based on the part of the country. I live. The car is clearly smarter than I am. So I have this manual, but I have to refer to it often so that I know what all the features are in it that I can be using it. And it even has this little short handy guide because he knows we're not going to get the big book out. But this little short handy guide, it says the quick reference guide, and it tells you, and just glancing back through it, I went, oh my gosh, I didn't know my car could do that. So just like with the car, there's so many features to the gospel that I think that we need to rehearse to ourselves today and go back over. So I want you to take out your handout that has the review of Romans at the top. Uh, I think that's the first page that you have. But before we start and go back, I want us to talk about Paul for a minute. I don't think we ever really fully looked at where Saul became Paul and where his whole mission started. So I want you to go open your Bibles to Acts 7, uh, way over in verse 57. And the context of, of Saul's conversion is Stephen, with the first Christian martyr, was being stoned for his faith. And Paul, Saul at the time was known as one of the chief persecutors of Christians. He was the chief of Jews. He was very well known, very well educated, very well established. And he was one of the main persecutors of the, of the believers. So um, I want you, I'm going to start in, in verse 54 of Acts 7. And it said, when they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. So Saul was there when Stephen was being uh, stoned. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Verse chapter 8. And Saul was there giving approval to his death. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Okay, now I want you to move over to chapter 9. This persecution continued to go on, and Paul was one of the chief persecutors. Now we're going to see what God's plans for him were. Chapter 9, verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue in Damascus so that if he found anyone there who belonged to the way, whether men and women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I'm Jesus, 
whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. Isn't that interesting? Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into to Damascus. And for three days he was blind, and he did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called out to him in a vision, Ananias? Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he's come here with the authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he will suffer in my name. So that's when Ananias went. Let me go to the next verse. It says, Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. What a dramatic conversion Saul had on the road to Damascus. And I don't know about you, but this story really encourages me because I have some family members that are not walking with the Lord and how God is so intentional and he knows right where we are and what we're doing and he can look at us and say, I can redeem that. I've allowed that for a purpose and I'm going to use the chief persecutor of Christians to become their teacher and their guide because the credibility that he brought to the gospel was the transformation that happened in his life. So I want you to think about that as we go forward. Later on today, I want you to read Acts 9, 1 through 22, and that's where Paul's testifying, find the Sanhedrin, and he lists all the many times that he was shipwrecked and beaten and imprisoned. And Paul wrote 13 books of the New Testament, Romans to Philemon, he wrote, most of it while he was in prison because the Lord called him and set him apart. And being such a student of the law that the Jewish people followed, Paul knew exactly how to lay out the argument for the gospel. And my husband, who is an attorney, when he was teaching through the book of Romans, did you know that years ago uh, the book of Romans was used in the Harvard School of Law to teach young lawyers how to lay out their case? because Paul so beautifully laid out the case for the gospel. He answered all the objections. He answered the questions. He, he refuted their disputes about it, and he clearly laid out the gospel for us, and we're so blessed to have it. And I really think Romans is the Magna Carta of the New Testament. That's where our freedom comes. That's where the gospel has spread. And that was the foundation that Paul used then. The, the other books of the Bible that he wrote were letters that he wrote to churches that he was trying to get started or to encourage people that he was ministering to with the gospel. And it was so important to him that they come to understand uh, exactly what God's plans and purposes were for him. So I want you to look at your handout, and we're going to look at the review of Romans. And Jada said in, her, in, the, in our workbook uh, that Romans walks us through four big categories. The first one is the righteousness that God required. And Paul so clearly spelled this out about the law and how the Jewish culture and the Jewish people had worked so hard to fulfill the law. They had made laws up to the laws. They were very law following. And in the Old Testament, the law was the tutor to tell them how they should behave prior to the coming Messiah coming. So Paul made it very clear that the law was what God required. He required perfection and righteousness. And that's what he required. I found this little poem about the law, and I think it clearly explains exactly the dilemma that we're in. It says, run, John, run, the law commands, but gives us feet, neither feet nor hands. Far better news the gospel brings. It bids us fly and gives us wings. A rigid matter was the law, demanding brick, denying straw. 
But when the gospel tongue it sings, it bids me fly and gives me wings. You see, the law had all these commands, but prior to the gospel coming, there was no power of the Holy Spirit to help them fulfill it. So they were trying to do it in their own strength. And they would make up laws to the laws in order to try to find righteousness with the Lord. And Paul's clearly trying to tell them that, second, the righteousness of God is provided through his grace on the cross. Through grace and the saving life of Jesus Christ, everything that God required in the law, he provides through his son, Jesus Christ. Number three, the righteousness of God's plan that he sent his son before the foundations of the earth so that we could have the salvation opportunity that we need. And then the righteousness God expects from us Every day is when he fills us with the Holy Spirit. So every one of the letters that Paul writes, he starts out telling us what God has done by sending his son Jesus. And he clearly sets out what God has done, and then he says what we do in response. And I don't know about you, but most of my Christian life, I started with the response. And I didn't always acknowledge what God provided through his grace, the power, the strength, the ability, even the desire to obey him. So that's why we need to rehearse the gospel to ourselves every day. Okay, there's some, I want you to open your Bibles now to Acts 3, 19 through 26. I mean Romans, excuse me. Romans 3, 19 through 26. If you're ever wanting the Cliff Notes version, if that's possible, of the gospel, this is a great passage for you to have. And actually your handout I made for you is kind of the Cliff Notes of Romans. So you might want to keep it in your Bible. So If over the holidays or sometime in the future you need to go over the gospel with family or friends, you will have a clear clear reference for it. So let's look at at Romans 3, starting in 19. Paul is lining out succinctly exactly the process that we go through to be saved. And and if you'll notice below uh, there, I have these key definitions, and we'll stop and look at those when we get done. But it says, now we know that whatever the law says it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. He's clearly saying observing the law does not, because we cannot be perfect. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. And that's what the law was in the Old Testament. It was a tutor to show them where their sin was. Verse 30. One, it says, but now, but now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Paul was clearly reaching out to both the Jewish people and the Gentile people, letting it know that both cultures needed Jesus Christ. There is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus." Okay, I want you to look over at your handout, and there's some key words there that I think we need to know because uh, it helps explain the gospel and God's plans and purposes. So the gospel is truly God's response to the gap in our righteousness. There is no righteousness in us. We've all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So God comes with the gospel to provide the help with the gap there. Grace is God's inexhaustible capacity to bless and bestow on us what we could not earn and do not deserve. I think we must rehearse that to ourselves every day. That grace cannot be earned and we do not deserve it. It's a gift from Him. That's why we must stand at the foot of the cross daily and really focus on that. God doing for us in Jesus what we could never do for ourselves. So God in His mercy poured all the wrath that we deserved for our sin out on His Holy Son Jesus. And that wrath was a holy hatred of all that is unholy. So sometimes I think I have to sit at the foot of the cross and think about the wrath that was poured out on Jesus because of the sin in my life and the horrid hardness of that and how Jesus was maimed and beaten and, and stripped and bloody and God poured out his wrath. The, the worst part of the punishment was that 
God could not look on Jesus anymore because he, he was bearing all of our sin. And I was listening to a Bible study yesterday, and this just really happened to me. When Jesus was on the cross and all the wrath was being poured out on him for our sin, God could not look at, it any, look at him anymore. That's when he started looking at us the same way he looked to his son who was perfect. And that's the way God looks at, at us going forward from our salvation. When he looks at us, he sees the perfection that Jesus provided for us on the cross. And you all, that's our new identity. We're no longer condemned. We're no longer slaves to sin. We have a new life, and the battery pack of the Holy Spirit is in us to help us walk that out. So God now looks at us the same way he looked at Jesus. That is his beloved child. That's how God sees you every day. Don't you know how the enemy wants to lie to you about your identity? And that's why Paul says over in Romans 8, there's now therefore no more condemnation to you. All the condemnation for your sin was poured out on Christ on the cross. So you're free to walk worthy of that, of that death that he shared for you. Okay, election, we talked about that briefly, was God's choice of an individual group our specific pur purpose or destiny. And the way I look at that is election is kind of like adoption where you choose to take someone into your life. And that's what Jesus did. He adopted us into his family. He chose to come for us and bring us salvation that we desperately needed. Uh, justification then is God's act of declaring us not guilty for our sins. I want you to look at Romans 4.25. I think it's so important for us to get our new identity based on what God's word tells us we are, are rather than the culture or sometimes even our own perception. So look at Romans 4, where am I? 25. <sighs> okay, turn the page, Carrie. Okay, uh, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to, raised to life for our justification. And that word justification means God's declaring us not guilty for our sins. I know some of you have heard it's, it's just as if you'd never sinned. That God looks at you and Jesus' righteousness is imputed to us. Our sin goes on him and that's how we are saved. Okay, I want to use this, this drawing. It's on your second page that I would encourage you to keep handy because it's called the Romans Road. And if you ever needed to go through the gospel uh, with family or friends, last week I had to leave Bible study early. I had six childhood friends that were coming for three days to have a girls' reunion. And I was so intent upon being sure that each one of them knew Jesus Christ as their Savior. I mean, I've known them since first grade. That's a lot of years. But you just don't know for sure. And I just asked the Lord and I had my friends praying, please give me the boldness and the courage to say, is it well with your soul? You know, many of them, one of them has lost a husband, one's husband's got dementia, and they're growing, going through some things. So this drawing is at the bottom of your page right down at the bottom. But I want you to see how you can work through this on a napkin at a restaurant or wherever you are. But this is, I taught first grade, so this is a dead person. That's why she, she has an unhappy face, okay? And she's dead, and she is dead in her sin, and the wages of sin is death. So here she is living in her sin, and here's God with the gift of eternal life over here. But there's a big gap between there, and that's where the but God comes in. So God on the cross makes a way where then we can come forward and be accepted by him and choose to walk, uh, to accept Jesus Christ as our savior. And I think that verse is, is, it's the verse that you can use to really share the gospel because it's, it spells it out. For the wages of sin is death, she's dead. <laughs> but the gift of God is eternal life. Here's the gift over here. But Jesus had to stand in the gap on the cross to make the bridge to get us from our dead in our sins to eternal life. Do you see that? Isn't that exciting? I think you can draw that. Uh, and in that little drawing down there helps you, and I think it's helpful to have the words on it, but Jesus Christ. You know, the buts in the Bible are most important, and many times it's but God. This horrible thing is happening, but God. This is what he did in his, in his perfect love for us. He, he came to share for us. You know, I want to share with you one of the reasons why I'm so intent about knowing how to share the gospel. Two years ago when COVID was raging and 
the kids were quarantined from school and doing home school, uh, Zoom class, and that was when the uh, break-in at the Capitol happened. And um, there was just a lot of upheaval in the nation. And I was with my grandchildren and my son, who lives around the corner from us, and his three children, Will's 16, Maggie's 12, Mary Blake's 8. And I looked back at them and I said, how are you kids handling all the tension that's in the world right now and COVID and school and all that? And Will uncharacteristically spoke up and he said, Gigi, I just watch you and Jimbo and mom and dad. And if y'all are okay, I'm okay. And I was glad it was dark and he couldn't see me crying, but that is when I just cried out to the Lord, let it be well with my soul so that when they're going through something, they can look at me and say, there's hope. There's hope, there's hope. And that's why we need to know how to rehearse the gospel to ourselves every day so we're ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within us. Now, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree because his dad, our younger son Drew, when he was at Baylor his freshman year, he was pledging a fraternity and I knew shenanigans were going on. <laughs> and that was before cell phones, so remember answering machines? And I would leave these messages on his phone. And I got a letter from him do y'all remember letters? They have stamps and paper. And I read it at his rehearsal dinner, and this is what he said. He said, Mom, I can tell by your tone of voice on the answering machine when you've been praying for me and when you haven't. Busted. And this is what I need from you, my job description. Mom, I need to wake up in the morning knowing you're praying for me. I need to go all day long knowing you're praying for me. And I need to fall asleep at night knowing you're praying for me so that when my faith is weak, I can draw from yours until I'm strong enough to stand on my own. That's a freshman boy at Baylor University. So I'm just gonna tell you how the Lord is giving us and equipping us with his word, his manual right here so that we, it'll be well with us and they can draw from our faith. Many of our family members are struggling right now. There's a lot of uh, financial woes, there's job problems, there's health issues, so much is going on. Our faith needs to be strong. We need, you know, Debbie requires us or encourages us 20 minutes a day in the Word for the rest of our life. I want five minutes of those 20 minutes for you to sit at the foot of the cross and rehearse what happened there because it'll transform and change what you do going from there. And that's my prayer for us today. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for Paul writing it and making it so clear to us, your plans and your purposes. And while we were yet sinners, dead in our sin, slaves to our sin, you came for us. You found us in the most unique locations. You poured out your spirit on us. You, and you let us know that you poured out the wrath that we deserve for our sin on your son Jesus so that we can make the exchange and have his holiness imputed to us. And then, Lord, at that point, the sanctification process starts where the Holy Spirit comes in to equip us to do what you've called us to do. And, Lord, our Christian life then becomes a response to your love that you poured out for us on the cross. Lord, I pray if there's anyone listening to this message today, whether here in the room or on the, on the video, that they will bend the knee and come to you, Lord, that you truly made a plan and have a purpose for us, that we don't have to stay dead in our sin, but we can experience eternal life through you. Thank you. Thank you for that glorious plan that you provided for us. Now let us be good stewards of what you've entrusted to us. In Jesus' name, amen.